Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We welcome your questions and comments throughout. Uh, the Edmonton Arts Council acknowledges the traditional land on which Edmonton Awiskwichi Waskahegan sits, the territory of the Tw Treaty Six First Nations and the homelands of the Métis people. We would like to recognize and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Nahewa Cree, Dene Sulene, Nakota Sioux, Soto, Nitsitapi, Blackfoot, as well as the Métis and the Inuit peoples. It is a welcoming place for all peoples who come from around the world to share Edmonton as a home. Together, we call upon all of our colleague, collective honored traditions and spirits to work in building a great city for today and for future generations. My name is David Cheris. I'm with the Grants Department here at the Edmonton Arts Council. We've been doing a series of free information sessions and workshops for working artists throughout the pandemic. Uh, we have sessions coming up on shaping casting for film and media with an intersectional diversity lens and for writing about cultures other than your own, both the minefields and the rewards of doing so. If you have suggestions for future workshops, please send me your suggestions. All of our sessions are recorded and found on the Edmonton Arts Council's YouTube channel, along with celebrations of our recent 25th birthday. And if there are any, and is there any others out there who remember the start of the Edmonton Arts Council, you are as old as me. Uh, prior to um, working at the Edmonton Arts Council, I had not thought much about how budgets interweave with artistic ideas in the shaping of a proposal or as a planning document. Uh, but after reading my 100th project budget here, it has become absolutely clear to me that not all budgets are created equal. And since they are meant to be an invaluable tool for communicating your goals and intentions internally and externally, it seemed useful for us to go over the do's and don'ts of constructing a budget. And who better to do this than Karen Brown for now. Um, Karen has uh, uh, um, recently survived a bike accident yesterday, but she is grateful for the support of her daughter, Gabriel, who is typing for her. Um, for over 21 years with Rapid Fire Theater, Karen uh, shaped operational project and capital budgets and used them uh, to uh, uh, direct the workings of a massive and multifaceted organization. So uh, if you can scroll for me, Gabe, as I go. Um, going back to the beginning, thank you, David, and thanks to all of you for taking the time to attend this talk. Um, I'm going to try to use your name in the chat when I respond to your questions so that you go, we know whose question it is that I'm answering if questions come live in the chat. Um, but we will keep a Q&A in um, the public chat and we will have a live Q&A afterwards. So I'm going to go over some general topics now that I hope to delve into a little deeper as we progress through the webinar. So let's jump right in. Uh, general objective of budgets. A clear budget will help you to define your project. What exactly is it that you plan to do? Are you writing a script? Are you making a painting? Are you filming a movie, producing a play, hosting a festival? The process of applying for public or sponsor support of a project is an excellent exercise in validation. Think of the questions these potential funders ask as guidance towards your own planning and intention. The purpose of public funding especially is not merely to provide you with cash towards your work, but to help you execute the project successfully. If you cannot answer the question specific to your project, you are not prepared to see it through. Often grant applications will ask you about what you intend to do, who you intend to hire to do it, how you will pay them, how you will market and sell tickets to your show or copies of your recording or your printed art. This often intense investigation of the project forces you to consider the objectives for yourself and will help to determine your readiness. Appreciate the value of this project as a standalone project, even if it is an organization that is producing it, even if the organization exists solely to produce this event. An example would be the Edmonton International fin Fringe Festival. The event itself consumes a good percentage of the organization's annual operating budget, but they are two separate things. The festival has its own specific costs and revenues, while the society has year-round operational costs and even other individual projects that require their own specific standalone budgets. So remember to separate the project from your general operations. You'll want to bring all the pieces together to complete a detailed picture of all the aspects of your project. 
Again, not to be confused with the general operations of the year-round organization, if there is one. Begin with a big vision of the project, your goal or main objective, and then begin to zero in on the details. Err on the side of too much information. You can bundle detail later. Better to have more than you need rather than not enough. Again, often funding application budget templates can be a great guide to help you gather the information you need to build out a budget. Maybe you wouldn't have considered rental costs for rehearsal space or per deal for your performers or first draft of your budget may be incomplete. And when you get to the funder application budget template, you'll find you are missing some of these elements. Use your resources. Even if this is your very first project as an independent artist or a collaborative or organization, you have probably participated in a project sometime, somewhere that was produced by someone else. Ask your former colleagues if they can help, if they might share a budget template that they have used, if they can help you to identify all of your potential sources of revenue and expense and ask the grant agents at the funding organizations where you intend to apply. They really do want to see you succeed. And so you can probably can probably help you to build out the line items for your projects. Um, okay, so we're gonna switch to a, a shared screen now. And so you're going to be able to see a little bit of my cheat sheet and also a document that is going to provide you, don't share yet, Gabe, please let's go into this folder where we can find the Pro that co copy of the CIP budget, open that, great. And then once we have that open, then we'll put the Word document back up over here so I can still have my cheat notes, bring it over and down and low, uh, not that low, I still need to be able to see it. Thank you for your patience, everyone. And go to shared screen, Gabe. Uh, David, I, I can't share my screen. It says that the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Try again now. All right, try again, Gabe. Beautiful. Terrific. Okay, so now Gabe, if you can just bring the word up. Okay. So I hope that you can see this. Oh, I like what you're seeing um, because you are not seeing my cheat notes. That's fantastic. This is a, um, a sample budget template. This is a real budget. It is one that has been used recently for the International Theatre Sports Institute to request funding through the Alberta Lotteries Community Initiatives Program. I'm using this with permission from the ITI. Gabe, can you go to the top of the screen, please? So that we can scroll up to the very top, just so that we can see. Terrific, okay. So this is a very simple budget that the CIP uses when you're asking for funding through their stream. At the top in the pink section, you will see all the sources of revenue. If you can scroll down, Gabe you will see all of the expenses. And of course, the objective is going to be to get to a balanced budget at the bottom. Okay, now let's scroll down a little bit further here. Okay, the sample we're using is a budget to produce a series of online symposiums intended to help improv theater producers improve their own delivery and technology for online delivery. The symposiums will use three stages to offer this training a panel discussion of experts online, uh, in online presentation, artistic directors, technicians, performers, a hands-on workshop with experienced directors focusing on the unique challenges of producing improv for an online audience. And finally, a public performance by students themselves showcasing and practicing the new Zoom specific techniques they have learned. What is the purpose of a budget? You can, you know what, it says shop share, but since it's just the screen share there, let's just leave it there and um, right. go back up to the very top of it. I think that folks are just as happy to look at that as they are to look at me. Um, so the, the purpose of a budget is a guideline for the project, a pitch for the intention, necessity and impact of the project. All of the justifications for the spending of the money are the same arguments you will use to sell the project to potential funders, indeed to do the project in the first place. In our sample, there are intended expenses, like the artists for the panel, the cost of interpreters to have this simulcast in multiple languages to reach a large international audience, the cost of technicians to preside over the live events, 
As we were going through this planning and completing this budget for potential funders, we discovered some costs we had not considered, like musicians for the live performances and curriculum development for the directors who will teach the workshops. We also discovered some areas of expenditure where we can, if necessary, cut costs depending on the success of our grant application and our ticket sales. We will perhaps reduce the number of panelists or translators if we find there isn't enough revenue to cover those costs. Notice that I said we, the development of the budget and the project itself was a team effort. First, a committee considered the best ways the ITI could reach out to serve its worldwide members during a pandemic. Then several notions were filtered both at the committee and the board level. This is a normal vetting process in organizations where a hierarchy exists. If yours is a one person operation, obviously you will skip that step. But understand that there is still value in balancing your budget and bouncing your project idea and your budget off some peers that you can trust. They may help you spot some of the flaws in your plan and in your costing. So in this case, once a decision had been made to proceed, then a smaller working committee was established, including the office staff, to work up a budget and to fine tune some of the project plans, the delivery methods, the schedule. The outline and some rough numbers went back to the committee for feedback and approval. It seems like a lot of process, but for publicly funded organizations, this is the norm. It demonstrates oversight, member representative involvement and diligence. It shows how a project must be deemed feasible by a larger group of planners and must go through its planning and budget scrutiny at various stages in its development and implementation. In some cases, funders will want you to tell them about the scrutiny and process, about your organization's capacity to oversee and deliver the project as part of the application questionnaire. Do or do not do. Is the project dependent on funding? Are you willing to abandon it if no funding is offered? How much can you adapt to react to less funding than hoped for? Is it possible for you to still do some version of your show or your CD with reduced revenues? What can you cut if you don't get funding? Or do you put the whole project on hold and reapply in the next cycle? Or find another funder? This is an especially important question for smaller organizations and individuals for whom there are no saved resources or operational surpluses that can provide subsidies to individual projects. When I was working at Rapid Fire Theatre, we would often discuss especially new initiatives in this light. Most of the time, a project came to us from the artistic team. A player had an idea for a new show or an outreach program or a training series. While we were always excited to support their new ideas, we had to be selective in which ones went forward. A policy we adopted was that these initiatives had to pay for themselves, so net zero budgets, whether we got the revenue from user fees, sponsors, or public funding. There were some projects to which we were committed, either through history or intent, our international festival, our high school league, that we were bound to pursue whether they broke even or not. A festival, by the way, almost never makes a profit. You do it because you are mandated to produce art as a part of your organization's objective, or because you are expanding your audience. In budgeting for something like that, you have to be prepared to absorb the loss for your overall operating budget. In our sample, we see an ask for $10,000 from the public funder. Internally, we understand that we may not get that whole amount. So we have envisioned methods of reducing expenses to reflect a lower income. The ITI cannot afford to take a financial hit on the project, so we will reduce scope or expenses as our revenues dictate. This brings us to dual budgets. One is the real budget for your decision makers. The other may be one you tailor to funders. Here's the difference. Again, using our sample, if a grant of $10,000 is received, we will proceed with the full scope of the, pot, the project. Scale down, scroll down please to the blue. You have to use this screen to do that. And you can see the detail of where we intend to spend the total of $20,000, assuming 10,000 from the funder and 10,000 in either uh, ITI injected funds or funds that are raised from doing the project. If a grant of $10,000 is received, we will proceed with the full scope of the project, including paying all of the artists a generous wage for their time, using all of the allocated marketing dollars to draw a bigger audience, investing in the best technology and technicians, hitting every single objective of the project vision. If we get, say, half of the requested amount, we will scale back. 
perhaps reducing the number of hours we are asking teachers and panelists to spend on prep for the presentations so that we can reduce their fees. We may ask them to donate a portion of their time for the good of the project. We can cut the number of translators, the number of technicians. We can ask the student artists to perform in the public shows without compensation. None of these are ideal outcomes and they do not reflect the desire to produce a professional symposium with professional artists at professional rates. But the team of developers can count on the volunteer support of international artists to in effect subsidize a version of the project. It need not be completely cancelled if the funding doesn't come through. In planning for this project, the ITI set up an internal real balanced budget that relied upon volunteer support, reduced professional fees and scaled back perhaps shorter presentations. It balanced with a revenue and expense of about 10,000. The version that we are looking at here reflects a more optimistic outcome of a project that is publicly funded. It is not a cheat or a lie to work with dual budgets. It is a realistic approach. In fact, in some cases, you may have multiple budgets if you are applying to multiple grant streams. Do your own budget first. Make your decision to proceed or not based on the merit of your project before applying for support. You can include some likely funder support in your internal budget, especially if you are confident of its appeal to those funders. Every consecutive budget for a sponsor, donor, or funder can be based on the general framework of this real budget, but it is not necessary that they line up. Each potential funder may see a different version of a budget for the same project, tailored to their own support priorities, limitations, or guidelines. It may appear that you are double dipping if you, for instance, ask for $10,000 from the EAC and $10,000 from the AFA in support of a project that only needs $10,000 in support to balance. But you don't know for certain that you will get both grants. You are not even certain that you will get either, or perhaps you will get a portion of what you ask for. In one budget, you may balance with $10,000 support from EAC. In another, you show that same support coming from the AFA with no EAC support. This is a perfectly honest approach. As long as at the end of the day, you spend public money on approved expenses and don't appear to be profiting by the amount of any given contribution. The EAC does not want to give you $10,000 towards a project so that you can profit $10,000 on that project. So make sure that you have contingency plans to spend all of the public funding on allowable expenses. You'll be expected to report on finances at the conclusion of your event. I'll talk a little bit more about reporting a profit a little later on. What to put in, what to leave out. Depending on funding model and guidelines, you will include or exclude some project costs specific that you know are real in terms of your project, but are ineligible for support. For example, again, looking at our sample, CIP project grants do not cover administration costs. So even though there is an office staff person who is working on, among other things, applying for funding, it is not an allowable expense, but it is a real expense. So it is included in the real budget, but it cannot be included in the request. In this case, some of the marketing, curriculum and development and event hosting costs have been exaggerated so that all the admin expense is included and the budget still balances. It is also true that a good portion of the admin expense is already reflected in the organization's overall operating budget. But for planning purposes, it is important to understand the real cost of executing the project. Our internal budget shows about $1,500 for admin expenses. Oftentimes, project funders, especially public funders, disallow capital expenses as they are seen as investment rather than project specific. If you need a new camera to shoot your music video, you may not be able to include that as a project expense because you will still have it years after the project is done. It may be possible to include some of the depreciated value of the capital item or borrowing costs if you have to borrow to buy it, but the full cost of the item cannot count as a project expense. If you are running a festival or a public event and you are purchasing alcohol for resale or for volunteer appreciation or for hosting an opening night, you cannot include that expense in an application through Alberta lotteries. Other funding bodies may have different rules, so you have to check the specific guidelines before you start filling in the blanks. And where do you get the numbers to fill in the blanks, especially if this is your first experience in budgeting? Some costs will be evident from various quotes you will have obtained from suppliers, like gear rental, venue rent, building materials. If you haven't obtained these quotes, take the time to do it. Your funders will want you to verify those expenses, and it's unlikely your best guess is going to be accurate. 
Here's a point about revenue lines on your budget. Recall that I earlier pointed out the importance of differentiating this project from the overall operating budget of the organization. This comes into play, especially if the organization will have to subsidize the project from its own general budget. In the sample case, we see the ITI contributing $5,000 of seed money. It's perfectly acceptable for your organization to make that kind of commitment and to show it in the budget, especially if it's required to balance the budget. What is not necessary is for you to divulge in your application budget, the general health of your organization. I have seen project budgets that included a group's net operational profit from the pre previous year as income on a budget line. Don't do that. That is not project income. That's kind of a key difference between a project budget and an oper operational budget. Two different pieces, two different funding streams, if you're eligible. We were talking about some of the specific elements of budgeting and one of the key line items in any artistic project budget is artist fees. This is one of the most difficult lines to complete because it can vary immensely. If you are a solo artist working on a visual piece, you may be thinking in terms of materials, studio rent, even marketing, but what about the artist's time? What is a reasonable rate to charge for an artist in a creation process? The honest answer is this varies from discipline to discipline and within disciplines varies again based on experience, availability, and in some cases, star power. At Rapid Fire, when we were paying visiting artists to come to our festival, we generally based a rate of about $100 per hour for instructors, but we actually paid nothing to visiting performers other than providing accommodations and helping them with travel costs. So European artists got more than their counterparts from say, British Columbia. However, when we brought in Colin Mockery for a headliner show, the rate was thousands, plus travel, plus accommodation. I asked around to some contacts in various industries. The responses were predictably diverse. At the Film and Video Arts Society of Alberta, FAVA, suggested rates are $350 across the board for key positions and $250 for assisting positions per day. Assuming that a filming day usually runs 10 hours, that works out to $25 to $35 per hour. But some folks, directors, editors, etc., can garner up to $50 per hour for their work. Compare that with just with the CIP's donated labor value guidelines of just $20 per hour for unskilled labor, $35 for skilled labor, and $70 for skilled labor with equipment. Think heavy machine operators. A quick search of the dance industry shows a range of $25 to $30 per hour. Keep in mind this would include rehearsal and developmental workshop time in addition to performance. Sources are the Economic Research Institute, the ERI, and Alberta ALIS. Actors earn, according to ERI, up to $49 per hour in Alberta, but Indeed.com pegs that rate at less than $19 per hour in Edmonton. I can tell you that some of the highest paid corporate performers at Rapid Fire earned about $300 per hour for a corporate gig, but those hours were very few and far between. And remember what I told you about Colin Mockery. The best resource is your colleagues themselves. If you are writing a play and hope to pay your actors to be in it, ask them how much they got for their last production. Ask them how much is their ideal wage and how much they can accept as a bottom line. Remember those two budgets? the optimistic publicly funded budget and the real in-house budget. This is one line that will change drastically depending on whether or not you are successful in obtaining funding. Most artists get this and they are willing to negotiate pending project support. And remember those colleagues with whom you have worked before, ask them how much they paid artists. How much did you get paid as an artist? Was it reasonable? A simple Google search on wages for artists or pay rates for dancers can give you an idea of where to start leading you to websites like the one I mentioned earlier, ALIS, ERI, ACTRA, Equity. Also, support organizations like the Alberta Dance Alliance and the Alberta Craft Council can help. If you can't find the answer on their website, give them a call. Ask your local peers, other similar organizations, or folks who have produced similar sized or similar priced projects. Ask your grant agent before you submit. This whole area gets further muddied in the case of co-productions, where artists are con all contribute in the hopes of splitting the gate or proceeds at the end of the run. When asking for funding support, how do you create a reasonable average payout for artists who have been working for potential wages? In your budget for funders, you'll want to reflect a higher end of the scale. Understand that your in-house real budget may well reflect the lower end, 
funding and ticket sales dependent. Avoiding the philosophical discussion about how much artists should be paid. What of the creation phase? An artist's work on a script or a song or a painting. Should they be paid for their living allowance? What is a reasonable amount? To again quote my friends at FAVA, this has far more to do with the jury's prejudice than any accepted rate. Most times juries will accept $1,000 to $1,500 per month living allowance. And once you get close to 2000, they start to dissemble. Within your own internal real budget, you may want to break out artist fees for, for, for performance versus per diem or living allowance versus travel if necessary. In reporting to funders, you may have to provide that detail or lump it together, depending on their templates. The onus here is to defend your numbers. Why are you paying your leading, leading lady $500 a week? If you can justify the expense using bio information, project description, even budget notes, then funders are less likely to challenge your projections. In fact, you are more likely to face a challenge for a budget that shows too little included in artist compensation. Most funding resources available to Edmonton artists, like the EAC, the AFA, CIP, Canada Council, want you to demonstrate a respect for the professional work of artists and to compensate them accordingly. You may have project specific questions about this topic. I'll attempt to get to them all in the chat, but we can address general questions in the Q&A to follow the presentation as well. Balancing the budget. How do you defend a project? Uh, sorry, how do you defend a profit? How do you defend a loss? What if you ask for, say, $10,000 from a sponsor and $10,000 from CIP, and your total project cost is just $20,000, as is the case with our sample? You sell some tickets to your show, and now you are potentially looking at a project that is making a profit. That is not a bad thing. A profit on a particular project can help support the work of the organization overall. For instance, in our sample case, if a corporate sponsor could be sourced, it would reduce the amount of cash that the ITI would have to inject into the project right now, $5,000. Even if a sponsor proposal was in the works at the time of the CIP application, we would not necessarily include it in a budget for a public funder. Here, it wouldn't really make much difference since the ITI is planning to inject its own seed money into the project. It could be that additional income from sponsors won't pu push your budget into a profit situation. You don't want to show that in applying for funding support. As I mentioned earlier, funders tend to eschew support for projects that don't appear to need the money. They will not want to contribute $10,000 to a project only so that project can profit $10,000. So in your spending reports to funders, you will increase your spending to absorb the additional revenues. Pay more for your artists or hire more artists or have a longer rehearsal period, or do more marketing. But what if at the end of the day, your project does end up in a profit situation? How can you justify that to funders? First off, some funders, CIP for instance, will ask you to report on spending only. If you told them you needed $10,000 to pay artists, and then afterwards you report that you did indeed spend $10,000 on artists, they will be satisfied. They don't even ask for an overall project profit and loss statement. Other funders, however, may want to see how the project fared, and so will ask you to show a profit and loss based on the budget you submitted. In this case, you may want to realign some of your entries to reflect a closer to balanced budget. This is not dishonest nor cheating. Let's go back to our sample for an example. If ITI were to obtain, sure, scroll up to the top. If ITI were to obtain its $10,000 from CIP, and then a sponsor came forward and added 5,000, the project would show a $5,000 profit. But remember that the ITI was contributing $5,000 of its own operational money. A budget report after the fact could simply, honestly, report that the ITI did not have to contribute $5,000 to balance the budget because a sponsor were found. Let's suppose an unlikely but incredibly lucky project outcome. You got all the funding you requested, you sold your capacity of tickets or subscriptions or product, you brought in unexpected sponsorship, the result was profit. You could, especially in the case of an independent production, choose to increase the payout to all the artists involved. As long as the rates are justifiable, that is a perfectly legitimate way to balance your budget. But if you've paid all of your artists a reasonable rate and you are still in a profit, it is okay to report that profit to your funders with an explanation. You may demonstrate that you are going to use the profits to subsidize future incarnations of the show or the exhibition or use it to purchase capital items to support the ongoing work of the organization. And here's a hint. 
If the project, if the profit is 10,000, sorry, if the profit is 10% or less, just report it without explanation. If your funders want to know more about your intentions for that money, they'll ask. What if you suffer a loss? Welcome to the club. Most art projects, especially new projects, lose money. It's not about making money or even breaking even as much as it is about producing the work, the art that touches people, that has an impact on the community. If you lost more than 10% on your project, you may want to add some explanations in your final report to funders. Were you able to subsidize the loss from your general operations or will it bankrupt your organization? Think back to the initial intent of your real budget. If you did the work in projecting at that stage, this shouldn't be able to happen. You, wouldn't, you would have projected worst case scenarios and built out some safety mechanisms. Were there unforeseen circumstances that caused your project to lose money? Something like, oh, a pandemic maybe? Be honest in reporting the loss and be honest in what you learned from it. Perhaps it will cause you to reevaluate your marketing strategy. Perhaps you will pick a cheaper venue in the future. If the project has well thought out, clear and accessible outcomes, it should be relatively simple to write this section as you would need to do, all you would need to do is go through the list of outcomes and explain whether it was achieved or not and explain why it wasn't achieved, including what lessons were learned and what next steps would be taken if the project were to be done again. If you share the lessons learned and the intended corrections for future projects, your funders will most likely be supportive and willing to stay on board for a future attempt. And remember, they are most concerned with how you spent their money on previous, uh, previously approved expenses. Let's talk about matching funding. Some funders insist on matching grants. The Alberta government loves matching grant programs, whether for capital or project grants. That means if they give you $5,000, they want you to contribute or earn $5,000 on your own. How will you garner your share of a matching grant? Will your matching funds come from an operational surplus from your organization? So just cash you have in the bank. Do you have the matching fan funds on hand? Are you anticipating them from accounts receivable? If you show your matching contribution as money on hand, you will be required to prove that you have the money on hand. Will your matching funds come from ticket sales? Are your projections reasonable? How did you calculate ticket sales or product sales or other earned revenue? It's great to proclaim your intention to raise $20,000 from ticket sales, but if you are only doing five shows for 50 people, that means each ticket will have to cost $80. Is that reasonable? Use your budget explanation lines to show the math and predetermine what a reasonable ticket price will be. Also, be conservative. Even if it's your 10th fringe show and you have sold out a 200 seater every single previous year, bank on 150 tickets per show. Be conservative. Will your matching funds come from sponsors? Have you had sponsors before? Have you already got sponsors lined up? Your matching funders will want to see that. Will your matching funds come from donors? Same questions apply. Will your matching funds come from another grant? That's fine in most cases, but you will have to demonstrate that you have applied and that you have a decent chance of success. In other words, prove it. Use your budget notes to demonstrate the validity of your source of matching funds and know that you will have to prove why you did not match a funder contribution in the event of a financially unsuccessful project. We covered that a little in the previous section on profit and loss. What about donations? What about sponsorship? In budgeting, <clears throat> there are three kinds of donations, volunteer labor, gifts in kind, and cash. The big note here is paper trail, paper trail, paper trail. In our sample, we see the ITI's intention to use donated labor from folks who will volunteer to host the panel webcasts. It will be necessary for ITI to create no charge contracts or invoices from those hosts to prove the donated time. If your project requires volunteer labor, a major art installation, for instance, then there are preset rates in most grant guidelines that dictate how much you can represent for volunteer labor. We talked about those a little in the segment on paying artists. Again, Prove it. Have your volunteers sign in or have a volunteer coordinator track levels of participation so that you can report the value of volunteer labor. In our sample, there is an intention to have discounted or sponsored advertising to reduce the marketing budget. This can easily be demonstrated through the marketing contract, which should clearly show the retail value of the advertising purchased versus the actual amount charged. In your budget, you show the full cost of the advertising as an expense and the discount value as revenue. 
As well, the groups that have charitable status can often issue tax receipts for clearly recorded gifts in kind, paper trail. There is an added benefit here that can spill over into operational budgeting in that tracking gifts in kind can raise an organization's overall earned revenue, which makes a difference in calculating operational grants, but that's a different webinar altogether. Finally, there are some grant streams like the Arts Best program that specifically target sponsorship and offer their own matching grant programs to encourage sponsor cash or gifts in kind. For clarity, do not confuse donations with sponsorships. In a nutshell, the difference is reward. A donor gives you money. A sponsor buys something from you, usually advertising, in exchange for their support, whether the support is straight up cash or gift in kind. Think discounted advertising in exchange for a logo on your website. It's smart to segregate these two revenue sources and imperative that you remember the Canada Revenue Service regulations on when you can and cannot issue tax receipts. The easiest to track, but often the hardest to attract is donated cash. It's okay. I would not include this in any budget unless you have a history of donations. Have you done a pass the hat event in previous years? Do your patrons respond to coin jar requests on site? Do you have a patron who writes you checks to support your work? Don't expect this to come if it hasn't ever before, unless you are planning an aggressive campaign and even then budget on the conservative side. If you have a charitable status, you can offer tax receipts for straight up donations, but be careful and follow the regulations carefully. Quick, quickly, you cannot offer tax receipts for any contribution that gives the donor something in return. Admission, a raffle ticket, a t-shirt, and obviously tracking these donations is not only beneficial to them for tax purposes, but also to you so that you can begin a donor database that will serve for future appeals and campaigns. Treat your donors well, make them feel special. It is perfectly okay to offer special donor appreciation events and recognition. Say thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Budgeting for phased projects. Maybe you're thinking of phasing your project or you want to build a plan that will allow you to phase a project if the socioeconomic climate dictates or for artistic reasons. My suggestion in this case is that your real internal planning budget shows the whole project, but perhaps you adapt the layout, the spreadsheet, so that it easily demonstrates the phases to your project. Gabe, we're going to change the screen share here. So go back up to your screen share and choose um the other budget i think it is okay. give me a moment yeah please bear with us because what i've done is i've taken the exact the same budget um and i've just added some additional columns this one to make it yes to make it demonstrate what it would look like if we were phasing um the budget now if you look go, okay. scroll up to, that's not that's not the one that's the same budget oh it is sorry Okay. Go to no. No. Go to the other that. one. There. Where on the right. On go? the right. Right there. Right there. Right there. Okay, that's it. Okay. Okay, but are Hold they on. Are Let me share it. No, it's not shared yet. Just give me a moment. Okay. Bear with me, everybody. Okay, awesome. All right. So if you take a look at this budget, it demonstrates the same. Um, all of the numbers add up to the same amounts, $20,000 in, $20,000 out, except that it is phased. And so it's indicating um, amounts that can be spread over a period of years. I've created this example. Um, in this case, because there is an intent to offer three separate symposiums, it's easy enough to phase out the project. Note how the bottom line is still the same. Expenses and revenues still add up to $20,000, but we've spaced it out over several months and potentially several intakes for the grant funders. That is one reason why you might wanna phase a project. It may reduce the amount of your grant ask in any given cycle, but still achieve the same total contribution over several cycles. This may be more digestible to your funders. Another reason is timing. Perhaps you want to create a piece in time for a festival or a season, and so you can space out the design, creation, and presentation phases. Availability of labor can also influence your project schedule. Perhaps you want to get started now on your play, but you know you won't be able to produce it ne until next year because your intended cast isn't available. 
In this current climate, there may be resources available for developmental work that will not be made public due to health restrictions for several months or even into 2022 or 2023. It may be beneficial for you to take advantage of funding streams currently open to begin a phase of your project rather than waiting to apply for a larger amount closer to your release. Phasing after the fact, that is changing from a one-shot project to a stage project, may be a way to offset potential losses and still retain overall project funding. In our example, suppose the full 10,000 is granted, but due to external events like availability of artists, the project is not completed on the intended schedule. A follow-up to the funders may be an explanation that the project has been phased to better capture the most audience and public participation. In this way, the funder contribution can be retained and applied towards the same project over an elongated period of time. The same might happen if the funder decides to only give you $5,000 or $3,000 or a potion, portion of the amount you asked for. Then perhaps you can go back into another cycle of the same grant stream and say, well, with the funding you gave us the first time around, we were able to achieve this month, this much. Now we would like to continue with the project. So please give us additional funding so we can adapt and continue with phase two and then phase three. That's the overview. I know it's a lot of information to take in at one time, but I hope it has answered some of your questions and directed you to resources where you can search answers for yourself. I'm happy to answer any of your questions now, as we've been doing in the chat. Um, also, David can help you get in touch with me on follow up questions as they occur to you. If I can help, I am happy to do that. So you can unshare the screen. Aaron, thank you so much. No if you're problem. comfortable in turning your camera on, uh, that would be terrific. Uh, we would welcome any questions. I know this was uh, uh, drinking from the fire hose. Uh, Karen is an extremely experienced uh, uh, writer and manager. Uh, but if you have any uh, questions at this point, we welcome them. We will be circulating um, a link to, to this uh, presentation. Uh, perhaps cleaned up with uh, to get rid of some of the pauses uh, and missteps uh, on our YouTube channel on in the next few days. Um, and if you have any follow up questions that occur to you later, as I said, I'm I'm happy to to funnel them to Karen, uh, who has been uh, gracious enough to offer her her assistance. Yes, no problem. Oh, thanks, Linda. <laughs> So, uh, if you don't mind, I'll I'll start out with uh, with a question, uh, uh, Karen. What at what stage do you like? Um, do you stop adjusting a budget? Like, if you're moving forward with a project, at what point do you stop looking, or do you are you always monitoring? Uh, and yeah, I, I think that a budget um, is a bit of a living document and it continues to evolve and to change pending the situation. Um, for instance, you think you have all of your funding in place. You think you have a fairly solid um, and anticipated incomes, but something changes, for instance, a pandemic or whatever that causes you to not achieve. It's usually on the revenue side. You don't hit the revenue targets. So you have to always be able to tweak the expenditures to try and keep the thing balanced. Um, if, you, if you're unable to do that, then you have to have some mechanism in place to cover a potential loss at the end of the day. Katie asks the extremely relevant question, uh, how do you uh, set a figure for the amount of unknown incomes, uh, earned revenues and, and like ticket sales, concession sales and the like? I think it can, it's funny that Kate, one of the questions that Katie's put in here is, can it be too low? And I think it can. I think that it's really possible for you to try to say, oh, well, we're gonna be very, very conservative. We're gonna assume that we don't sell any tickets at all. Well, why on earth would a funder want to fund your project then if nobody is going to see it? Um, you want to make sure that you're going to represent at least some uh, potential attendance. So be realistic. And as I mentioned in the fringe example, even though you have a sellout friend show and you've sold out year after year after year, when you are budgeting for your ticket sales, budget conservatively because it will demonstrate to your funders that you've got a little bit of a buffer put into place. But, if, but you should definitely budget 
with what you've seen happening on par for that kind of a presentation. I know that Katie's example is a film festival, but um, another uh, a theater festival or a theater show, an opera, all of them are going to vary in ticket price depending on the audience that you're attracting and depending on the, the scale of the show that you're going to do. Tickets at the Citadel cost an awful lot more than they do at the Fringe. Um, so you have to be realistic about who your audience is and how much you can reasonably charge for tickets for, for that audience. In, in a lot of festival environments, you often have a history that you can draw on. And if finding out, for instance, uh, how films have typically drawn uh, at past festivals uh, that are similar to yours. If you're doing a fringe show, you can find out what the average attendance for a fringe show was. And while those, you know, are at best rough uh, guidelines, they're at least a starting place. Absolutely. I'll amplify from a funder's perspective, one of the things that um, Karen um, uh, raised um, in terms of, of showing, uh, showing expenses in your budget and especially expenses to pay artists. Um, you do want to to approximate an industry standard if you can, um, but never feel embarrassed to, to put uh, a chunk of your money towards paying artists. Uh, not only uh, is it good for you uh, in terms of the, the karma of doing the work, uh, but it will reflect well within in any funder's room that I've seen, and I've seen dozens of them. So uh, don't be afraid to, to say we're choosing to put 50, 60, whatever percent of our total budget uh, towards artist fees. That's much, you're much more likely to, um, uh, to raise flags for lowballing than for paying too much. I think it's a situation too, David, where um, it, we understand that there is a vast discrepancy between varying levels of artists. Um, the artists that work to produce small shows in Edmonton or even large shows in Edmonton who are working for a few hundred dollars per week, perhaps, um, are not, they understand that you're not going to get a call and mockery for that price. You're not going to get the, um, the top talent uh, not to say that our artists are not top talent, because I think they are, and they can stand up against any anywhere from anywhere in the world, but they don't get paid the same rates. And so they understand if you're bringing in a big star, you have to pay for a big star. And usually that is expressed in the form of a headliner show. And I think everybody recognizes the varying scale of, of paying performers to be uh, in, to, to participate in your production. I think most of the shows and most of the folks who are probably attending tonight are not talking about bringing in headliners. So it's probably not a factor. Um, what we may be looking at more and more realistically is that one line that we talked about a little bit, which is um, basically cost of living. So how much do you pay an artist in the creative stages? And I think that those guidelines, you know, the 1,000, 1,500, once you start getting close to $2,000 a month, for an artist's living allowance, then you start to, to, to push the acceptability limit of most juries. But um, I think as long as you can justify how much does it cost to live in Edmonton, to pay your rent, to, to eat, to survive, that uh, you're able to justify paying that to an artist who is in the creative stages. Exactly. Uh, some funders do establish a, a standard uh, subsistence rate, but uh, the Edmonton Arts Council, for instance, doesn't. So if you are an artist who has extraordinary living expenses for whatever reason, uh, because you need a special assistance uh, because of a disability or, I don't know, um, whatever your specific circumstances are, explain why you're setting the, the, the rate that you are and the significant, any significant deviations from uh, what people might expect uh, an individual's living expenses to be, and they'll go along with it. Um, yeah. 
I, I feel like we've we're um, we're at seventy five minutes now, and we've we've provided a deluge of information. Uh, so do feel free to to pop in with additional questions. But I love to finish off these sessions um, with uh, an invitation to turn on your cameras, um, to turn on your microphones. We'll blow out the the audio quality on the presentation, but it's a chance for all of us to thank. Karen for uh, for her extraordinary work and, and sharing her wisdom in this. Um, so uh, Karen, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. Uh, we very much appreciate your time. And yeah, uh, I would do that, but that's kind of hard for me to do the wavy back thing now. <laughs> so, uh, thank you also. To oh, thanks, Gabe. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks also to Gabe for, for being there and being a fantastic um, uh, support for her invalid mom. And uh, we, will, uh, we will look forward to, to seeing all of you um, uh, hopefully in person very, very soon. And if not, uh, then at future sessions. Um, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your week. Yes. Okay. And, and I can't say enough, David, just if, if someone has a particular question that you think I can help with, please send them on. Uh, I'm happy to talk to individual folks. Um, I'm, I'm available. Now, I'm not doing much these days, so <laughs> I'm just sitting on the couch right now. So this might be a phone call rather than a series of long emails is what you're saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm a one finger typist right now, just for the next little while. Just noticing, looking up and glancing out the window, David, I don't know if you see it, but it's snowing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it started. So, yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. So, and Katie, you've still got sunshine down there, don't you? Sure do, but you know, they're promising snow tomorrow, so. Oh, great, well, you can have it. Right. Well, okay, thanks everybody. Uh, then right. Merry Christmas and- <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>